Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. The okay. more I see about the world, the more I, more Romans 1 becomes glaring. Oh yeah, Romans 1 in the, uh, in, in, as Paul says that, that the world has, uh, has chosen to not see and to not hear and have, uh, have just put a damper on any influence of God in their lives. That, uh, Paul, Paul points that out so clearly in Romans 1. They've suppressed the knowledge of him that he's made clear. Uh, you can't you can't look at a mountain mountainside. Um, you you can't uh, look at a, at a at a gentle stream and not see God God in work at work and see His creation. But we have devised we being humans have devised ways to uh, to suppress that knowledge and and uh, it's 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 destructive to our people. But it's not anything new. It was no, going on plainly in Paul's. In, it was going on in plainly in Paul's day, and continues through to our day. And the and more, more that that, we, that, people that people suppress it, it the knowledge of God, and the more they fight against God, and the more they accept evil, evil the more foolish, foolish and debased, debased their minds, minds become. become. Mm-hmm. And, and the, the evil, evil just continues, continues to spiral. To spiral. Yep. Any other questions or comments this morning? This morning, this afternoon? I slept for two seconds on uh, this afternoon, so now I think it's morning. <laughs> okay, so here, let's go with the with our questions then. Here's my uh, here's my first question: Why study First and Second Kings? Sandy would say we shouldn't. <laughs> I don't know. I think we just need to do that as a as a basis, so we know what went on in history. And I'm certainly not the one that can remember all the events of the years, but yeah. I think it's good to know, or to at least have some knowledge of what what's there and how it came to be. Oh, I know what's there. I just don't care to revisit it a hundred times. Yeah, I, I, I understand what you're saying, Sandy. There are mornings when I when I sit there and I'm feeling fairly good, you know, and I'm reading or listening, and I go, well, that was like 15,000 people that just died. I don't yeah, feel good anymore. <laughs> you know, and, and so I, I understand I understand the frustration. And uh, go ahead. I think that one of the reasons that we need to study is because as we study it, we see how God continues to intervene in lives even when they screw up. So that gives us hope that when we screw up, God's going to continue to intervene in our lives. And that God never gives up on people. And, and that the consequences of screwing up big time, what what they you know what the consequences are when you mess up like that. Okay, that's good. <laughs> Nancy thinks I'm going on further though. Oh, I'm yeah, sure you are. <laughs> the Apostle Paul in Second Timothy three sixteen said, Blank is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. What is the blank? All scripture. All scripture. So when I when I read this, I go, you mean I even have to read Job? Job is the most frustrating book in the Bible to me. No, the genealogies are more frustrating. Oh no, I love the genealogies. <laughs> 
<laughs> but but the, the Apostle Paul re- writes to young Timothy, all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, uh-huh. for correction, right, right. and for training in, in righteousness. And there so you as, you're, as you're reading through sections of historical narrative like like kings and chronicles and and samuel or even even uh judges uh judges is a frustration because they don't learn you know how many times how many times do they get to go through the cycle and not learn Mm -hmm. so when i when i look at all scripture like mary said i'm reminded that god god is there and and he he's after his people but he's given us the tools we need to teach, to correct, to reproof, or or reorient, and uh, for training us in righteousness. So there, there's a lot that goes into all of that. If we remove the historical narratives, we have we're we're missing a lot of of how God works okay. with people. Okay. As I was studying this, I came across a uh, an article by Dr. Gavin Ortland. Uh, who was writing for an article for Crossway Books. And he said, here's four things, <coughs> excuse me, four things specifically on studying First and Second Kings. These four things are, beginning with, First and Second Kings helps us put the whole Bible together. Mm-hmm. If you, if you don't, if you don't have the historical narrative of First and Second Kings, the entirety of the divided monarchy and half of the united monarchy is uh, is missing from our understanding of God's working with the people. Well, that first makes and, sense because the, the prophets don't make sense. Right, right. The First and Second Kings teaches us what revival looks like. We don't need Asbury Seminary to do that. We we have record of it in uh, in the text, as there is occasionally a revival going on in in the in the narrative. First and Second Kings shows us how God is at work during difficult seasons. I wonder what the narrative will look like. Should God write one about? the church in 2023 oh my goodness gracious but think about it is it any worse than what was going on in israel and judah in the 700 bcs 800 bcs no i I don't think so i only said good gracious because we have so much more revelation oh yeah and we, we could know so much better how to live, and we don't. That's why I said what I said. That's a good point. We're going to be held accountable for knowing a lot more than uh, than what the uh, people in, in uh, Israel in 700 B.C. did. <coughs> and finally, First and Second Kings reminds us how badly we need Jesus. It reminds, you know, we probably don't need a reminder every day about how bad the world is because we kind of see it on our news and stuff every day. But it does remind us that what we're going through, the the scene is different, the actions are different, but the sin is the same. It's it's like the world was. Now, I would add to, to this list from Ortland, uh, I would uh, add some additional things. Um... I would add that First and Second Kings document the kings of Israel and Judah as they relate to the law of God. How how is it described? How are they described in their as they have a brief um, comment about their uh, their uh, monarchy? They did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, followed David, or they didn't. All of the ones in Israel, they didn't do what was right, and and we're told that. But it's interesting to me that those those um, descriptions relate to how they respond to the law that God has given them. There's a significant fo- focus on each king and how they observed or failed to observe the uh, the law of God. 
I think it's when I when I when I recognized that when I was going over, I I printed out a whole long list of of uh, those verses that where they're described. You know, so and so uh, served 15 years and didn't do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. I looked at all those descriptors, and what I what I came away with was there's a reason that we're told how they responded to the law of God. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking you know, about the context of the entirety of Scripture, the progressive revelation of, of Scripture. And I, I came to the conclusion that God had us see how each of these kings responded to the law because what was coming soon for them was a final exile in Babylon and when they would return from that I, idolatry would be put aside but now there was a, 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 a focus on the, a laser beam focus on the law so all of their history was talking about how bad they didn't follow the law and so now the pendulum swings the other way. They come back, come back out of exile, and there is a laser focus on the law to the point that they don't see the law giver anymore. And so, as I'm as I'm looking through this, I'm I'm recognizing that God's telling us this so that we see why the pendulum swung the way it did. Which reminds us that we need to be careful about our pendulum swing as we respond to other things. We we had a discussion today in the fellowship council meeting about why we we have some of the procedures that we do and uh, they're in response to some some processes that were in place 100 200 years ago that took us away from from scripture. You know the the uh, quote or the, the motto that has become the motto of the uh, Karis Fellowship and several of the, of the, the uh, Brethren Tradition churches, the Bible, the whole Bible, and nothing but the Bible, is not something that started with Alexander Mack. It started with Henry Holsinger, who was, was kicked out. He was disfellowshipped for a while because he was revolting against a committee of conference that had... Um, the authority to set rules at the same level as scripture and and in our history the the fellowship had been that way and in response to that Henry started a, a movement and said let's focus on scripture the Bible the whole Bible and nothing but the Bible nothing can supersede the Bible and that ended up in one of the one of the splits of the late 1800s in which the Church of the Brethren, and what became us um, disfellowshipped each other. Um, but that was a revolt against things that were, it was a pendulum swing. Things went too far this way, and so we revolted and went that way. And it's interesting to me that God shows us those things in Scripture as a way of reminding us, hey, pay attention. Don't get carried away one way or the other. Listen to what I'm saying. You know, what I found interesting with those statements was that, yes, in the northern kingdom, all the kings did, did, or did evil in the sight of God, but they were there was also rates of evil because oh yeah near the end, there was a king, there were two kings who did evil, like Jeroboam, but not evil like Ahab and Jezebel. Right, right. And that was pointed out. Right. Some of the kings were not as bad as the others. They were all bad. Right. They just weren't as bad. Right. Right. But God thought it was really important to point that out. Right. By reading First and Second Kings, we also see an interaction of the people with the prophets. Those guys that were standing there and saying, listen. Elijah, Elijah and Elisha, yeah and Isaiah and Jeremiah and w- what we see is a rejection of the people that were speaking for God so that shouldn't surprise us that the world says to us hey I really don't like what you got to say because that's what's been going on for a long time 
And so all of this plays, I think, into the, into the ultimate removal of God's chosen people from the promised land, just as God had covenanted with them to do. So God is, in First and Second Kings, God is laying out the groundwork that what's going to happen ultimately is Israel's going to be gone. We saw that in today's reading. Israel's gone. Assyria's taken them. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. And what we're going to see coming up is ultimately Judah will go into captivity. Mm-hmm. And they'll be removed from the land. There won't be Jews, primarily Jews on the land at all until God brings them back after 70 years. And then everything is different. The focus on the law has become paramount. That all happens in the exile. Um, synagogues are a product of the exile and the post-exilic world. And in the way they that Jews did everything is a product of what happened in the exile. And so if, if you don't read First and Second Kings, you don't see any of that. You don't see how, what leads up to that. I don't like all the... Uh, um, I don't like all the blood and guts and gore in it, but I think God has some valuable messages for us in it. Questions, comments? Okay, let's go on to a fun one. Was Elijah poofed? Oh, Was Elijah what? Oh, maybe, maybe, Sybil, maybe yeah. you haven't heard. We ha- we have a doctrine at Friendship <clears throat> um, called Poofology, and it is the doctrine where uh, where God at various times has has um, raptured, moved, translated, whatever word you want to use, people, taken them off the scene and taken them out. And so we've uh, we've established a doctrine of poofology, <coughs> and so we uh, we refer to those movements as uh, as poof. Uh, Philip, after speaking with the, econo- uh, the economic, the Ethiopian <laughs> eunuch uh, was moved uh, forty miles or so. That was that was a non-translation poof. Okay. So, so was Elijah poofed? No. Interesting. I didn't expect you to say that. <laughs> he had an escort. He had a chariot ride into heaven. Oh, he well. Didn't just, he did but, not just vanish. But did he have a chariot ride into heaven? Well, he had a flaming uh, chariot. That went with him. Mm-hmm. Well, that actually separated him from Elisha, but he didn't ride the chariot. Mm-hmm. That's he rode true. a whirlwind. But he didn't ride the chariot. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But here's what I didn't I didn't know until just recently. I came across this when I was studying for something else, and I thought, oh, I need to make notes because we'll come across this. (laughs) For I've I've long been fascinated by by the story of Elijah, and and uh, the the whirlwind and the chariots of fire and, and so forth. The prevailing view has been that Elijah was taken up in a whirlwind, mm-hmm. translated, and taken to heaven. There may be, and don't, don't form a judgment until we're done, there may be some biblical grounds to argue Elijah was not taken to heaven. Emphasis on the may, but in 2 Kings 2.1, we read, now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. The problem we have is with our English rendering of the Hebrew text. The Hebrew grammar, which is corroborated by the Greek grammar of the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, might more properly be understood as up toward heaven and not to heaven. So if we were to read this as, now the Lord was about to take Elijah up toward heaven by a whirlwind, you might not conclude he went to heaven. Now, add to this, 
where do old te- where where does scripture tell us Old Testament saints went at death? Paradise. Abraham's bosom, the paradise side of Abraham's bosom, right? That is not the same thing as heaven. So, you could argue that taking Elijah to heaven would be abnormal. Not impossible, but abnormal, right? Because Jesus, when he gave us the account of the rich man and Lazarus, told us that's where... where, uh, uh, Old Testament saints went. They didn't go to heaven. I don't believe they got to heaven until Jesus' resurrection. But that's a case for a different time. Add to that that nowhere are we told anything in Scripture that would lead us to conclude Elijah was in heaven or was not in heaven. It's pretty silent. But then who appears with Moses at the uh, at the transfiguration? Elijah. Elijah and Moses, right. And so you have Elijah who was taken up by God in a whirlwind and Moses who was buried by God. We also have most scholars believing that the two witnesses of Revelation 11 one is Moses and one is Elijah. Seems like a perfect cool. role for the for the two uh, um, that were there at the Mount of Transfiguration. So, if God took him to heaven and translated him, he got to be in a heaven. He got to be in heaven for uh, arguably 700, 800, 700 years before. Um, the rest of the Old Testament saints. Not necessarily a theological issue. We just don't have a statement of it. Um, With the proper understanding of the grammar, it it doesn't mean he didn't go to heaven. It doesn't mean he did go to heaven. And so, I'm going to plant my flag on, I can't say for sure. Clearly, he had to be somewhere... Um, afterwards, and we have no record of anybody seeing him afterwards. They looked for him for three days and couldn't find him, but that doesn't mean that he wasn't trans- transported more than three days' journey. That's not out of the realm of what God can do. So, I'm going to argue... I don't know if he went to heaven or if he was transferred somewhere else, lived out his days and died and was part of the, uh, of the, the, the group that was uh, released from uh, Abraham's bosom. I don't know. Okay, then I have a question. I'm not, I'm not saying you're wrong. You're not wrong. Well, I can't be but wrong because I didn't take a position. N- normally, normally only your soul. Right now, our soul goes to heaven. In the Old Testament, it went to Abraham's bosom. Right. Where did Elijah's body go then? Don't know. Um, what those that hold fast to to him going to heaven say he was translated and given a uh, a glorified body the problem i have with that is paul says jesus was the firstborn of the resurrection and so i don't believe there could have been somebody in a glorified body before jesus so i would discount so what, that so how so what body did moses and elijah have on the mount of transfiguration you have to make the argument that they had a temporarily temporary glorified body and they weren't yet resurrected or and and I probably prefer to to view it this way um, they didn't have anything but a spiritual body and uh, the Peter, James and John I think think that's who was there at the transfiguration got a glimpse into the spiritual world because remember, I'd be they, more likely to, agree, to think that than to think they had a temporary body. Yeah, well, there's there's a whole group of people that believe when we die, 
we will get a temporary physical body in heaven. They they base that on on. I I don't really I don't know of any verse that really would lead you to that, but they come to that conclusion. I was gonna say there's no scriptural evidence for that. That's just no. somebody's thought. Right. Right. But but we do have evidence for the fact that God opens the door to uh, for certain people in the word to have glimpses of, of, right. of heaven or spiritual things. So that would make more sense that they got a picture of that. Right. I just, for a long time for me, it was settled. He was taken up to heaven in a whirlwind. And as I study it more, I just, I, I can't, I can't say that he was because the grammar doesn't but, allow, it doesn't, doesn't mandate that. But I don't know that it matters in that sense because I think that to most Old Testament people, their understanding of heaven would have been Abraham's bosom or paradise. I don't think they had an understanding beyond that. So to them, that would have been heaven. I don't think they had an understanding beyond it. Yeah, but that's not the issue. The issue is whether or not he was actually taken to paradise or was translated and taken to heaven or was translated transferred to another part of the world. What would be the purpose of transporting him to the other part of the world? Just that removing no him from, from Elisha's world so that Elisha could go on and take his double double blessing and, and go on in ministry. Removing the, Elijah remaining in ministry would have been a barrier to Elisha um, stepping up to ministry. But that's more of a stretch then because it's very... Um, you know, th there wouldn't be a purpose for it due to th thought that somewhere in Scripture there would have been another appearance or another announcement of Elijah then, not just that he was transported from here to there. Yeah, I don't, I don't think you have to have another announcement to make that real. There's just too many unanswered questions of something that I, for a long time, thought was settled. There's just too many un unanswered questions. Yeah, I don't think that to me the the difference between up towards heaven and up to heaven the difference that to me that's not significant because to the Old Testament person up towards heaven would have been it would have been could have been paradise or heaven that was the same to them I don't know it's just things that I agree make with Mary yeah. <laughs> Just things that make yeah. me scratch my head and go, how many other things do I believe that I can't prove? That's why these things bother me. Is because I have a I have a, a, a belief set and sometimes I come to the conclusion I can't prove what I believe. And that bothers me. Where is he? He's in heaven now. Where was he for seven year seven hundred years? I don't know. As close to heaven as any believer could get. I don't know. Well, he wasn't in hell, that's for sure. That's correct. That's correct. Like I said, as close to heaven as anyone could get. Either in heaven because God took him there or it's paradise because God took him there. Okay, what's the difference between Syria and Assyria? In our, in our text, we've been reading a lot about Syria, and we've been reading a lot about Assyria. What's the difference? Syria is north of Israel, and Assyria is on the Euphrates, way across the desert. Very good, Sybil. My COVID brain still works. Sometimes I wonder. <laughs> She gets an A in geography. That's it. Well, I slept all day so I would be up to par. <laughs> I fall asleep all the time. I fall asleep all the time. Good for you. On the, your body saying it's got to be better. your body saying you need it. Yep. And that, that's very common with what you're carrying right now. I, I That's all I want to do is sleep. 
map. On the screen is uh, is a, a map of the extent of the Assyrian Empire, and uh, it is it is an interesting map in that it takes into account what we refer to as Mesopotamia, which is modern day Iran, Iraq, goes up into Turkey and some of the Stan countries, comes down and takes over the entire Levant, and then down into Egypt and follows the Nile down. It, uh, we have Assyrian contacts way south in the Nile. Syria, on the other hand, I don't think I put a map in for Syria. No, I didn't. But we saw Syria in, in, on the, in the print. Yeah, Syria is a small, um, a small section, just to the north and a little bit east of uh, of Galilee. It is headquartered in Damascus. The largest they ever got was a little bit north, maybe as far as what is the modern day boundaries of Syria. Assyria was a large multinational, multi ethnic, uh, multi tribal nation. Um, Syria was typically viewed as one tribe, never had a big impact on what was going on. Assyria had tremendous impact on what was going on. Um, Assyria was the was the 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 nation na the nation that conquered the ten tribes to the north. Um, they were ruthless. Um, they what we picture today, Al Qaeda, ISIS, and so forth. They learned how to do that from from history. Because those same folks from the same region uh, did exactly that. Uh, Assyria had a headquarter, had a capital city that kind of moved around. There were at least four different cities that were capital cities of uh, Assyria over the period of uh, several, a couple of thousand years that they, uh, well, 1,500 years at least, that they had significant influence. Uh, Nineveh was the was the, the, the largest and uh, most significant capital. Of course, Nineveh is where the prophet Jonah was told to, uh, to go and evangelize, and he said, God, are you nuts? I don't want to evangelize those folks. So Assyria is, is a nation that was, was built on a military, on military power, and on uh, um, the sovereignty of the king. The king could do whatever he want, there, wanted. There was no checks and balance on the king. And he ruled the military with such force that he could do what he wanted wherever he wanted it. And so you had a bunch of uh, kings that were really nasty, vile guys. And then you had some guys that, that treated people pretty good. But their, their normal mode, the reason they were so powerful for so long, is they didn't allow people groups to remain intact. Um, as we saw with the ten northern tribes, they were displaced, and only the weak and infirmed were left at home. And they were sent all throughout the, the, uh, the area that Assyria had, uh, had control of. And so you had this dismantling of people groups, so they couldn't build power. And uh, and ultimately get them. What came to their 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 uh, demise is the Neo Babylonians secretly, quietly amassed um, alliances with other small people groups until they were able to uh, overtake um, Assyria, and then within. Uh, Within two generations, the Neo Babylonians gave way to the Persians, and then the Persians gave way to uh, to the Greeks, really uh, uh, Alexander the Great. And so the Assyrians they laid the groundwork for what would become the Roman Empire in the East, because of all the people groups that they conquered and brought under control, 
and then those people were taken over by uh, first Babylon and then the Persians, which are kind of the same thing, and then uh, by the Greeks. And then the Greeks were taken over by the Romans. So the Assyrians play a large role in punishment of Israel and in the shaping of the boundaries of, uh, of the world. So, I think that's also why the, there was, the, the ten tribes never came home. Because the ten tribes never stayed intact to come home. Yeah, there, I, I, recent weeks have done quite a bit of a reading on the, the lost tribes. Um, there, there are significant strides being made in Jewish DNA. And the vast majority of Jews today across the world have a predominant DNA structure of, uh, of from Judah and from Levi. Some tribes they are able to isolate the markers for those individual tribes, but most of the tribes they have not yet. So when we say lost, it's really true. They, they are by and large lost, or the predominance of, of Judah in intermarrying with other Jews from around the world um, has just taken dominance. So we don't know. I, I did learn, I didn't know this before, but there is a large um, contingent of black Jews that claim to be descendants of Levites that fled at the uh, at the time of 722 and then were in, enhanced um, at 586 that settled in Yemen and then left there and settled in South, in near South Africa. There's a the largest group of, of non-Israeli Jews in the Middle East is in Yemen, a very Muslim mm-hmm. country. But they are the right. closest that we have to any practicing Judaism of of uh, of the time of Jesus next to the Samaritans. And this group of black Jews down in uh, in South Africa, they have also um, some significant practices like the Yemeni Jews from and the Samaritans. And so it's really strange how God has protected some bloodlines, but we don't know of the others. But God does, because he's going to reconstitute the tribes. But 12,000 of every tribe are going to be little evangelists or big evangelists. Exactly, right. And so God somehow knows, and I shouldn't say somehow, God does know who they are and has protected them over the course but we don't know who they are, and the Human Genome Project and all of the studies that go into uh, to the to the human genome um, and understanding DNA and all of the groups, they haven't traced but two tribes of significantly traced two tribes in Israel out of the thirteen tribes. Okay, let's go on. I want to talk just for a little bit about kings with two names. Here is a uh, here is a chart of kings with two names. I can send this out if people want. Um, We see two kings in Israel and several in Judah that have that scripture refers to them as names. What what got me on this quest was I'm reading yesterday or the day before and I, I see um, Jehoash and Joash. And mm-hmm. it's in the same same section. I'm going, wait, what did I miss? What's going on here? I got confused. And so I started looking at, at the descriptions, descriptions and we don't change discussion of a of an of a king but all of a sudden the text in in second kings is using a different name and so i did some some research and there there apparently are more than i had realized of kings that are referred to by different names now as you get later on in judah 
we have a number of kings that are described by different names because they were given new names by the by the kings of foreign powers that over that that overran them that they became vassals of and so that that plays a role but in in referring to Joash there was no there was no no descriptor that hey I'm going to change the name of it's the same guy but I'm going to call him something different and most of them in that category are just variants of uh, of spellings of the name they're not actually different names but it makes for us to have some confusion when you're reading mm-hmm. I, I was reading and I wait who, who, who's the I thought we were talking about Jehoash and, and, uh-huh. and, and, and so that I just wanted to to let you know that there were a number and and if you want the I can send that li, that uh, chart out for you mm-hmm. that, that would uh, be helps. good that helps that would be good okay I will do that okay oh, okay so what are the chronicles of the kings in Israel? Conic- Con- what are the chronicles of the kings of Israel and Judah? What are those books? I guess I didn't phrase diaries. my question right. Diaries. Right. Are they biblical? Official re- they're not biblical, but they're the, the official, official records, records that are kept, kept by the king's scribes, scribes of all the things that the kings, kings, kings did, did, but we don't have them anymore. anymore. That's correct. The, the technical term for that is they are not extant. I love that word, extant. They're not extant. They they are not they're not able we're not able to see them. We don't know if they exist anywhere. If they do, we don't know about it. These are the official records of the various kings um, that Israel and Judah kept. It would be kind of like what they keep the official record of Congress and and what all this fight is going on about National Archives and stuff. Wouldn't it be cool though if we had them? What's that? Wouldn't it be cool though if we had them? Well, I don't know because they may not always agree with Scripture. Mm -hmm. Because they're recorded by what the king wanted recorded. And so rarely will a king have recording of him not doing it right. (laughs) That's true. So, I, I'm sure there's a reason that God said, "Hey, I'm not going to give you, the, I'm not going to let you have those books." At least that's the way I would view that. So they're not canonical, and they're just daily registers of what went on. But what what makes me go, "Huh," is is why we have it recorded so often that that's where the records are. When I see that over and over again, I want to go, well, where are the books? Why are you telling me about these books and I can't read the books? Maybe it's for the Jews at some point to search for them. Maybe the Jews David, will find them, yeah. Maybe God will display them. the significant in the same time in the tribulation. Wouldn't that be cool? So maybe they'll show up with the ark. Some little kid will uh, will throw a uh, a stone in a cave in the, the northern desert of Judah and come across a whole bunch of new canisters that have all these records in them, and it'll be Dead Sea Scrolls version two. That's how the Dead Sea Scrolls were were discovered. A little boy was out in the desert playing with his dog and his his sheep, and he was just. Uh, uh, using his slingshot, and he shot into the mouth of a cave, and he heard something go, Dink! Wait! That sounded like glass broke. So he crawled up there and found these scrolls, and they're still finding new scrolls in new caves. Maybe we'll find the Library of Alexandria. We have the Library of Alexandria. About we, have a, we have a significant portion of the library. Okay, final question. Maybe. What's significant about 2 Kings 17? 2 Kings 17, we read it today, or maybe yesterday, uh, records the fall of of the ten northern tribes to Assyria. 
What's significant about that event? It happened just like God said it would. It was a fulfillment of prophecy. It's keeping of a covenant, yes. And I think it's one of I remember thinking about this yesterday. I think it's one of the reasons why in Jesus' time the Samaritans were hated. Because the Samaritans were people that were brought in by Assyria. Yeah, right. Oh, it's absolutely true. The Samaritans were hated because they were half breeds. They they right. were whatever Assyria brought from wherever around Assyria, Mesopotamia, uh, up into Turkey and so forth, and uh, they they uh, cohabitated with uh, the old and the infirmed and some of the people that were left in uh, in uh, Israel. Absolutely, that's why they were hated by by the now. God, not God fearing, but law fearing um, Jews that re re inhabited uh, um, Judah, re inhabited right. Israel. But what's the significance of Assyria going into captivity? No, northern Israel going into captivity, not Assyria. Yeah, that's what I meant. Israel going into <laughs> no. captivity to Assyria. Yeah. yeah. What's significant about that in the scope of, of biblical history? You're disobedient, how do you get out of my country? Okay, that's true. It, it's, it's, a, it's a keeping of the covenant that God had with them, that their failure to do what he told them would ultimately result in their being, uh, being um, disciplined. That's absolutely true, but I think it's bigger than that. I think Israel going into captivity is the beginning of the period of the Gentiles. I think it's the beginning of yes. God setting Israel on the shelf. And there I, I mean was going to say of, it of starts it really starts, starts the world, world history. history. Well, it, it, it starts, it, it is the phase out of Israel and ultimately leads to the phase in of the church where, where God says, look, I'm, I'm going to deal with you. I'm going to deal with the world through you. That, that was what, why he made Israel his chosen people, why he chose them out of all the other nations was to, to deal with the world through Israel. And then he begins to phase Israel out. So he takes 10 tribes out of the way in 722. And in, uh, then by, in 586, he takes the other tribes out of the way. They come back in, in, uh, in 70 years. But they're never really under their own sovereignty. They're occupied by somebody else. You know, the, the northern tribes... Um, under Assyria, Assyria was taken over by Babylon, Babylon taken over by Persians, Persians taken over by Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great then dies young and divides up his territory among the four generals, two primary generals, Seleucid and Ptolemies. They fight over Israel for a long period of time, and ultimately Rome takes over Alexander the Great's territory, and... Uh, then 70 AD, General Titus takes over Jerusalem, sacks the temple, and in uh, 72 AD, the uh, Masada falls, and Israel is done. And we don't see Israel again until May 1942. May 5th, no, or is it May 8th? May something. Because it's coming out very, very soon. I want to say the 14th, but I don't know. And so you have you have the phase out of Israel. 722, 586, 70. Um, and then now we're in the process of the phase out of the church and the phase in again of Israel. You have the reestablishment of Israel starting in, uh, in, in uh, 
1948. And then we'll have the tribulation. You'll have the, the removal of, of so many world powers uh, because of the, of the removal of the church. And you'll have the tribulation. And then at the end of the tribulation, Israel will be completely the focus of God again. And Jesus will be on the throne. You're that, correct, May 14th. That is the that is the, the the phase out and the phase in and the phase out that I see in uh, in the world's timeline. So I believe 722 marks the beginning of the phase out of Israel. And so May 14th, 1948 marks the beginning of the phase out of the church. If this is the Israel that uh, is in the end times. This Israel may go away and have to be reconstituted again. I feel a little bit while we are all looking forward to the rapture, and it's going to be wonderful, but I feel a little bit, a smidgen, the rapture is the punishment of the church since we are so earthbound. He says no. You are then you're going to come up. I don't know if that thinking is right or not. I have to think about that, that it's the punishment of the church. A smidgen. Oh, I think it's the blessing of the church because we don't have to go through the tribulation. Yes, but let's forget the tribulation. We are so earthbound. The reason I say is we are so earthbound that while we all yell and scream and smile and, oh, we're looking forward to the rapture, but we really love this earth. And God says, you're done. You well, are done. You're no longer a witness. Then up you come. Yeah, the great modern uh, philosopher Kenny Chesney says everybody want to go to heaven, but nobody want to go now. But this is what the rapture is going to look like. Who on earth is he? He's a country music singer. <laughs> Sybil, look at your screen. This is what the rapture is going to look like. Oh, you got it. Okay. I'm gone. That's funny. Yeah, Kenny Chesney, that famous uh, modern uh, contemporary <laughs> philosopher. Everybody want to go to heaven, but nobody want to go now. Yep. It'd be okay with me if I go now. You really yep. would. Yep. Any other questions or comments? Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.